I'm Ian White and I'm the senior tutor here at Cliff College and I'm also the executive director of MICA 68. Um, MICA 68 is a ministry that I've been involved in for the last 10 years, helped to set up uh, MICA 68 because it's about acting justly, loving mercy and walking humbly and I'm in, a, in conversation with a very good friend of mine uh, overseas and as part of our global uh, vision weekend it's uh, my delight to introduce you to Suzanne Sahori. So, Suzanne, hi there. Hi. Hi, Ian. <laughs> hey, really good to see you. Now, before we actually explain who you are, where you are, and, and the important ministry that you do, you've had some very good news in the last 24 hours. What's that good news to tell everybody? Oh, I'm a grandmother. Uh, a little baby girl. Her name is Leona. So, um, under this Corona and COVID-19, you have, you get some good news. I'm a grandmother. I'm so, it's a precious baby. It gives hope with this baby. Congratulations. That, no, it is. We need some hope in these times. And uh, I've seen the photos of, well, the film already. And Leona's got uh, hair as long as yours already. I don't know how. <laughs> Amazing. So, Suzanne, we've known each other for maybe 20 something years. Um, yes. And we first met when I actually bumped into you in Bethlehem many years ago, many years ago. You're the executive director of Bethlehem Fair Trade Artisans, um, which, uh, which we're going to ask you to explain and, and say a little bit about that work. And, and together, Micah 6 a who I represent, and you, BFTA, Bethlehem Fair Trade Artisans, I've uh, been trying to work together for the last few years and we'll try and explain a little bit about that partnership. So, first of all, where are you? Where in the world are you? I, I've said Bethlehem already, but where are you? Yeah, uh, in the Bethlehem district. I am in, the, in a small city only five minutes away from Bethlehem called Beit Sahur, which is the city of the shepherd. So anybody it, that's been across and done a pilgrimage and arrived in Bethlehem have often by coach gone to Shepherd's the Field, Shepherd's that's Field? right, Bet yes. Sahur, and that's where you, you live and you have your work there at the moment. That's where your family is and where you're... I'm born in Bet Sahur, my family in Bet Sahur, and I love living in Bet Sahur, and I love living in Palestine. You've not always lived there, have you? You've lived uh, elsewhere in Europe as well, because the English is very good, but uh, you, I you lived, live in England. Um, I got my degree from the USA. Mm -hmm. Um, I got um, computer science and minor mathematics. And it was, um, if I have few minutes, just one minute to tell you, I think I told you, Ian, how I uh, ever even went to the States. Um, it was a group of pilgrims walking from Jerusalem to Bethlehem uh, to the shepherd's field. Uh, that was when there was no borders, no checkpoints, uh, no separation wall. So this group of women, we were walking down my street where my family lives and they were very hot. So my grandmother with the traditional dress, actually she approached them and just did the cross to them. She doesn't speak any English and told them you want water. So she called me and I uh, gave them water. My mom came, she invited them for dinner. Wow. So all these ladies, they come for dinner. We don't even know them. They get a Christmas gift from my mom. She used to make sweaters. And then they ended, we ended up at the end that they were all from Siena Heights University in Michigan. They were all professors. <laughs> and they said they had never seen such hospitality. And they offered to give me and my sister a scholarship study at their university. Wow. So, well, no, I, I don't remember that story. So there yeah. you go. The handing out of some water gets your scholarship. Just hanging out water. And then we had dinner. We sang Christmas songs together in Arabic and they sang Christmas songs in English and it was such a lovely night for them it was they have never seen such hospitality that they offered my dad to take me and my sister uh, it's a Catholic school private uh, Catholic college now it's a university but when I went it was only a college and uh, they said uh, giving back some of the hospitality that my dad and my mom offered them and we studied for free. And this is like, it's a dream. Maybe this was the beginning of the path that I'm walking now. It's because I got this great opportunity. Then 
I must do something different in my life. Oh, wow, that's an amazing story. Now, um, well, well, let's move on I, then to, to the path you'll take it. I've also, also received such hospitality from, from friends <laughs> in Bethlehem and yourself as well. I, I recognize the table and the room that you're in now. So yeah. tell us a little bit um, about your role. So you are the executive director of Bethlehem Fair Trade Artisans. First of all, what is that? Now, um, the idea came, you know, I worked with, um, I was um, the public relations officer for the mayor of Beit Sahur from 2000 till 2005. And this was the time when the second intifada, the uprising against the Israeli occupation started. And that was five years where it was full closure, um, it was curfews, and uh, uh, the Bethlehem district was closed for so many days. Then um, I got to learn more about my city and my people. I used to receive at the mayor's office women who wanted uh, money for medicine, women who wanted money to take their children uh, to a doctor. It was so many human cases that I got to learn. And I realized most of these people that are coming to the mayor requesting support and help are artisans' families. The carvers, the, um, the beautiful traditional carvers that is made mainly in Bethlehem, Beit Sahol, and the city of Beit Jala as well. And that's when I realized I must do something to those people. And that's when I started Bethlehem Fair Trade Artisans. It's an organization that cares and uh, deals with the family owned uh, olive wood carvers, women who do embroidery at home, the ceramic from Hebron, the nablus soap. It is to keep the tradition and to reach, uh, to reach the whole world, to have our traditions, our craft sold all over the world. Because we use the slogan, earn the money with dignity. I don't want any grants. I want to earn money with dignity. This beautiful uh, carving, uh, this beautiful uh, handmade olive wood uh, figures, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, um, they are made with love from Bethlehem. So and I decided are, to start are. this organization. And indeed, yes. I have one of them here, very much and made with love. So that's uh, a olive wood heart. from Bethlehem. Yes. So, um, so we, I started the organization in 2009. And actually, without the support of people like you, Ian White, with your project, that's how we built it up. And I think you remember very well how we started with no offices. Mm -hmm. After two years, we got a building for free for 10 years. Uh, we didn't have a computer. We didn't have a table. We don't have chairs. But we built it step by step. We went out the ladder, up the ladder, one step at a time until we reach where we at now. I mean, I remember when Ian, you used to order maybe for $500. Today you order $1,000 every month. So this is, this is a way to support. You are buying a craft that you appreciate. And we appreciate your support because you are giving uh, a family uh, an income with dignity. Well, thanks for that. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit about Micro 6 8 and its response. Fair trade, so Bethlehem fair trade artisans. I mean, I know that there are many different outlets in the Bethlehem area, uh, lots of different souvenir shops. It's where many tourists, when they're allowed to come in, and at the moment, obviously, we'll talk about the closure, but yes. when they're allowed to come in, they're often taken as a group, uh, a pilgrim group, maybe to a particular souvenir shop. Um, yes. You've decided to do something different, and, and in your title, you've got this fair trade. Why is this important? Why is it different, especially for the artisans? Because um, we are their umbrella. We protect them. There are fair trade principles that we dear and value very, very much. These fair trade principles protect the artisans. It protects their rights. It gives them a fair payment. It gives women and men equal fair prices. We started from the zero to work with different uh, artisans to learn from them. What can we do for you? What are the problems you are facing? I'm not buying from them and selling you, Ian. It is working with them. We are a family all together with these artisans. 
Uh, what what now, sort of number of artisans are we talking? How many different families are you? We with? have now 43 family-owned olive wood workshops. We have four special needy groups, which is the handicapped. And we have women from all over Palestine. We work, we chose people who really need us, not people who are really a huge businesses. It's not a huge business. Um, mainly the olive wood carvings, if we remember many, many years ago, it used to be the carvers used to be sitting outside the nativity church carving in front of the pilgrims and pilgrims will be buying from them directly. Today, it's, it's a massive souvenir shops all over Bethlehem district. And like you said, when a group comes in, he goes to a souvenir shop, he buys a product that is six, seven times as much as it costs where the artisan is getting only a yeah. small percentage of this carving. He is, without these artisans, we will not exist. They are number one. And they need to learn about their rights. They need to learn about uh, protecting their families, providing a good living for their families. Um, so we are providing them with an outlet where they are selling their products through the fair trade channels, through people who believe in the fair trade and people who believe in the rights of the artisans also. Uh, now we have women, yeah. I think, you know, people are used to the idea of fair trade, especially here in the UK. They think of fair trade in relation maybe to parts of Africa and other parts of the world. But to hear that this is actually an issue at the very heart of, of the land that we call holy, that many pilgrims would have visited. Indeed, you've hosted many groups from our college uh, trips to uh, the uh, Holy Land. But to think that there is a fair trade issue right at the heart of Bethlehem, that's what you're answering because these artisans need support. You know, because fair trade movement, when it started many years ago, it was for the farmers, for the coffee, for the banana. Yeah. So uh, those development countries like Africa, Asia, they are more famous than uh, the Holy Land and Bethlehem. Uh, they people, when they say, oh, there's a fair trade shop in, in Bethlehem, we need to look it up. So when they come in and visit us and meet the artisans and look at the products, look at the prices, it is, it is a fair price. So um, it is really... Uh, we are trying to reach out the world to tell there is fair trade in the Holy Land, in the heart of the Holy Land. And so, being in the city of Bethlehem, this is like an honor for us where we cherish being a Christian uh, from the Holy Land. We cherish being living here with our Muslim friends, uh, where we cherish each other. We have in the office, uh, Muslims and Christians, we work together. Mm -hmm. This is Ramadan. Uh, our Muslim uh, staff are also fasting. You know, we try to be really respectful for them, uh, not to eat food in front of them, not to, you know. Uh, it is, it's a country where it has the three religious, um, Muslim, Christians, and Jews, where we all need to learn and live together. Exactly. And one of, one of the aspects of what you attempt to do is, is dialogue and I know uh, peacemaking. So it's a very difficult situation. And normally Bethlehem, and I know now, people who've visited again will know that it's surrounded by the, the wall, the separation wall. Um, but now in COVID, you are almost locked down doubly because first of all, to get out into greater Israel, you would have to go through checkpoints. But now COVID has limited you again. So what does that mean for the artisans? Because you can be making all of these, but I mean, how on earth are they earning a living at all, unless people like yourselves? You know, um, we actually, after China, after uh, China, we were the first maybe city to be locked down. We have been locked uh, in, the, in lockdown since 5th of March, when the first cases arrived in the hotel in Bejala. People were so scared. Yeah. Cities were closed. The lockdown, people were afraid even to leave their homes. I remember even for us as BFTA, the first three weeks really we never left the houses because we didn't know what's coming to us. Um, there was one case after another, one case after another and uh, the closure was, I mean, until now, we've been since the 5th of March until now. Only this week they started to ease up a little bit the lockdown, but 
you cannot go to Ramallah, you cannot go to Beit Jala. Now, like they allowed us to go to Bethlehem, but only at a certain time. So souvenir shops are closed. The most devastating for us is the closure of the Nativity Church and the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem and the Nativity Church in Beit Tahor in Bethlehem. It is closed. I mean, today I went to Bethlehem, to the uh, municipality of Bethlehem, and I saw that uh, the nativity is closed. It's empty. It's a dead uh, city. It's a city that uh, three months ago was full of um, uh, pilgrims. I mean, pil pilgrims were waiting in line a couple of hours to go into the nativity church at least. And I know because I've, I've, been, I've been in those queues and, and to think of it being empty, desolated and, and obviously people afraid, um, that must be terrible. What, what does it mean then for the business and the importance of what you do? Because I know you're attempting to reach through COVID and over the wall and out. Hence why, and we'll come on to our little partnership in a minute. Yes. Um, Ian, you know, um, we have, like you said, two major issues that are obstacles in our lives now. The main major issue is the uh, separation wall, which has been built in 2002. And I wrote the first article about the separation wall saying that, come on, the Berlin Wall came down and now Israel is allowed to build another separation wall. They are separating two nations from each other in such a small country. Mm. Now, with the COVID-19, of course, um, the most affected sector is the handicraft sector. 60% of the population of the Bethlehem district are living from tourism, hotels, uh, souvenir shops, uh, you know. Uh, but now the most affected are not the souvenir shop, not the hotel owner. Uh, the most affected is the artisan, the small family artisan who's, who sells through us who sells sometimes to souvenir shops, who sells sometimes to Israel, to, the, to souvenir shops in Israel. He has zero, null income for the last two months. We are meeting with them every day. We supported them with some humanitarian aid. We gave some people money to buy medicine. We bought some uh, food for some families that we know they really need it. But this is not enough. It should be the government's work willing to take care of all those people and support them during these months. They are the most devastated sector, devastated sector. They have products, they started to produce actually January, February, a lot of products because this was supposed to be the best year ever for tourism. So artisans were just producing in January and February, thinking, yes, I will have many orders. I will sell to this souvenir shop and to this souvenir shop. I will ship to somebody who sells in the U.S. to churches. So, but now they're all ended up that all the stock that they have produced is sitting in their homes. They have no source of income. Unfortunately, uh, we as BFTA are trying our best. We are contacting people like yourself, Ian, other uh, clients, other partners of ours. The fair trade um, and BFTA, I'm not treating Ian as a client. Um, you are a friend because we, we work with transparency. You know the artisans who make your products. You come to Bethlehem. You stay with us. You live with these families. Uh, by bringing a group to us, um, you buy from our fair trade shop, you, we export to you and you sell at the same time. Uh, to, you know, all of this, this is a, a family. Uh, our artisans are in a situation that maybe not till the end of this year will be recovered. Yeah, it's devastating. And, and I, think, I think everybody realizes that this is in for the long term and tourism is going to take a long time to get back. But when you're a tourist and you're just going to a hotel to have a look around, it's a shame we can't go on holiday. But actually when you're a tourist, an ethical tourist that's arriving into a region and you want something to get to know the people there or maybe uh, buy something that's meaningful for that area, then it, it's people, as we're hearing here, these artisans that could suffer. We're coming towards the end of our time, Suzanne, but, um, and I'm just gonna say a little brief thing about Micah 6.8 in response to that. We have been friends for many years, part of, my role in Micah 6 8 is to help people such as yourselves and uh, projects such as yourselves 
but as a friend. And what we are attempting to do in Micro 68 is enable some of those artisans to, to receive the best um, monies for their products and also to release some of those products around the world and here in the UK. Uh, many people have been blessed with uh, crosses and hearts and uh, godly play sets and Christmas items and embroidery and soap and and I continue to do that and so I'll make a little appeal here uh, to anybody that's uh, watching our dialogue here that if you want to find out a bit more then uh, do contact me on Micah 68 uh, or you could go, uh, contact Suzanne directly on uh, Bethlehem Fair Trade Artisans and uh, within our conversation now we'll make sure that you have the contact details. Is there anything particularly you would want us as a community to think about or to pray for uh, in relation to your work or maybe you as a person because I know that you carry a lot of this yourself Suzanne. Um. We all need prayers, Ian. We need prayers that we will all come uh, to come out of this um, this uh, this disaster that's really happening around the world now. And uh, special prayers for our artisans and their families. Um, and we want people to think uh, about us. We don't want you just to give us money. When you make an order, when you buy a beautiful statue or a beautiful heart then you are supporting somebody in, um, in the Holy Land. And come and visit. When, when life becomes normal, it will never maybe be normal, but please do come and visit us. Join the pilgrims that Ian and other friends of ours in the UK who are really organizing and coming to... Uh, it's unforgettable. We offer um, family meals, uh, home meals. Uh, you stay with families, you learn more. It's the fair trade tourism that we are working on. Um, come and visit us and be with us and uh, buy a gift when you go back. Well, thanks Thank you very much for that invitation. No, that's great. Thanks for the invitation. I'm sure we'll want to take that up and I certainly want to uh, bring another group out, um, hopefully now in 2021. I know that you're organizing their um, kind of fair trade uh, tours as well, which are very interesting. So we'll describe a bit more of that. but. Suzanne, it's been great uh, to speak to you today, and you'll want to get back to that uh, granddaughter of thank yours, you I'm sure. Thank you for this great opportunity. <laughs> thank you, Ian, very much. Well, and be safe. You. Thanks for being there, and God bless you, Suzanne, and all the work that you do. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.